Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Masaro Method. I'm really excited to welcome Georgie from Ukraine Matters to the show. And if you haven't been following Georgie, Georgie is a, a wonderful YouTube blogger. He's been tracking the conflict. He's got, well, you know, he does these, he does these, he does these fantastic um, live streams as well as sort of map uh, view as to what's going on. Uh, with with Russia's genocidal invasion, and he's just been so pro Ukraine and pro victory. And uh, Georgie, I mean, it's just it's wonderful to meet you finally. This is uh, our first time chatting, uh, and also we're we're going ahead and recording it, and uh, we're going to post it for the audience. Absolutely, really happy to be here, Paul. Um, I already told you that uh, I was really looking forward to at some point speaking with you. Like you've been a very big proponent of Ukraine, and to be honest, my whole journey here on YouTube as short as it was, was basically meeting people that I was just using, used to watch. And now I'm, well, having a very nice conversation. And I want to also say hey to everyone that is watching this. Yeah, right? now, you're, now you're one of us, right? I mean, now, <laughs> in, in a sense, now I'm one of you. I mean, I, I, I was just doing Twitter, you know, and then I, I was like, oh, well, you know, I should start doing some videos, start doing YouTube. And I mean, I, I love it. It's so much fun. And you guys are so dynamic. I, I had a chance to meet some of the others that are doing this kind of thing, like Jake Bro or uh, Artur Rehi. Um, and I mean, it's just everyone's just so excited and so dynamic. It's a great community. And it's a it feels like a totally different community. So like, maybe maybe that's a good place to kind of like start. I mean, you we were, we were speaking briefly before we started recording that you started your your page in July or around then? Is that is that right? I mean, how did you how did you get involved in this kind of, uh, I guess, commentary analysis community? It's actually a very simple story. It's uh, as my Twitter handle basically states, it's like an accidental YouTuber. So what happened is um, my some of my relatives and friends are right now on the front lines and uh, in Ukraine. So they've been threatened with missiles and strikes every day. So that got me a little bit of more it. And I'm a um, just by the nature of myself, I'm an information sponge. If there is something that might be found about something, I will find every information available about it. And at some point, someone at work, as it tends to be, just started discussing, hey, what's happening in Ukraine? Like, what do you think is happening here, there? And I said, like, well, guys, you're wrong because there is this source that says about these things. And I was explaining this to people. And then I would open a map to them on Google or where and show this is actually where the Russians are, this is how they want to try to capture Kyiv, but uh, they're failing and so on and so on. And um, that uh, kind of grew up into, instead of every week explaining to people live, because people didn't always work at the office, so they would be uh, Friday evening just, hey, Georgie, so how's the situation in Ukraine? Like, you know, somewhere on Facebook or other social media. And at that point, I would write a lengthy text, and then I would refresh a tab, and then the whole text is gone. So I was like, okay. Right. Well, uh, now, now it's uh, completely awful. So now I need to spend additional half an hour rewriting this. So instead, I decided, okay, I'm going to record a video, and then I'm going to post it. So for about a good like month or two months, I was just uh, recording um, completely private videos that I just sent the unlisted links to my friends. And then basically, at some point, I just switched it on to to, okay, let's make it public. And it kind of started picking up from there and there. Now it's history. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a great way to get into it, right? It, it, almost like out of uh, convenience's sake, like, like, oh my God, people want to hear this. Let me make this, you know, and before too long, you've got the audience you do now, which is, which is fantastic. I mean, it's, it's almost a public service that you're doing, being able to um, educate people about what's happening uh, in, in this invasion. I mean, so you, you obviously knew something about what's going on prior to starting your channel and prior to getting involved. So how, I mean, why is that? I mean, you, you're, you're Latvian. I mean, is it, is it because you're Latvian? Is it because you're European? Obviously, you're, you're based in Denmark, so you're, you know, a little, a little further from the front line. I mean, I, I imagine there aren't an awful, awfully large number of Danes who are thinking about this every day. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to be wrong. I'd love for everybody to be thinking about this every day. I think we all should be, you know. Um, but I mean, why, why, why were you so well informed on this? Why, why is this so important to you? Well, as, as, as being Latvian, I've lived through the the difficult parts of relationship that we had with Latvia with Russia. Uh, we actually had a territorial dispute, which actually no one knows about, but many Latvians know about that. Latvia, that Russia actually. 
uh, took part of uh, what was considered by many part of Latvia. Historically, I think it was 2003, 2004, right before us joining the European Union. And I think uh, one of the reasoning was that just so let's not make any con conflicts here. Let's just join the EU and let's get on with our lives. I think that was the idea. And since then, obviously, the relationship with Russia has been the, the best. We were the original Nazis before Ukrainians became the, the modern day boogeyman. So, right. yeah, yeah. And, and then I, I kind of got into uh, Ukraine at some point. And uh, now my wife is also Ukrainian. So I'm also related with the family oh. ties. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I also have a lot of friends there. And that's pretty much it. So for me, understanding kind of Russian mentality, their imperialistic ambitions, their attitude towards the war, their understanding and looking at their neighboring countries as basically just their backyard, despite whoever they are and whatever political stances they want to take. For them, it was always yeah, it doesn't matter. It's it's all uh, part of Russia anyway. It's just temporary. They're pretending they're independent countries. <laughs> Stupid Baltics. Uh, but um, but uh, with Ukraine, as 2014 came along, basically that's when uh, a lot of propaganda campaign about Ukrainians started. That's when the narrative shifted. That it's not only the Baltics that are Nazis. There's actually Ukrainians are neo-Nazis. Uh, so and then yeah, then I basically went to Ukraine, verified all of the lies that they told about what's happened in Maidan, just like you know, with my own eyes. I was like, yeah, this is the country that I remember. People are very nice and so on. I mean, if you've been to Ukraine, you know how nice it's, Ukrainians I mean, yeah, are. Yeah, it's fantastic. I was there last September. I mean, I, I mean, there's nowhere. It's funny. <laughs> There's nowhere I feel more American than Ukraine. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's like it's like the people there are so committed to kind of what, what we consider our founding ideals in this country. But from, you know, I mean, these are ideals that we, sh sh so, you know, strive and, and sometimes struggle to to uphold. Right. I mean, it, you know, it's it's hard to wake up in the morning and fight for democracy and fight for freedom and try to maintain uh, a society that I think is in, in a sense. Um, not very natural to humankind. Natural is like giving into your darker emotions and rallying around the strong man. And I mean, maintaining a maintaining a, a, a you know a sense of human rights and respect for one another and stuff like that. That's you need to be able to take deep breaths and have a clear head and, and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, and and you get this feeling in Ukraine that like, oh my God, like they are putting their lives on the line for this. Every single person here is totally committed to their country, but also to the notion of the free world and the, and the, and the kind of, they, they absolutely view their fight as an extension of the global fight for democracy, which I've tried to get America to recognize, you know, and, and, and I mean, I, I absolutely see it the same way. So I don't know, it's just, it, it's very exciting to be there. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Ukraine is a very special place. It's a very, it's a very special place. I, another thing I wanted to say in response to um, your your remarks there was, you know, I, I, anytime I'm speaking with um, uh, the Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, I, I always, I never fail to mention that the United States never recognized the Soviet occupation of the Baltic states. We all, we never, we never saw them as part of the Soviet Union and. Uh, you know, obviously fought for for their uh, independence as well, and and I mean to me it's 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 part of the great American tradition. It's part of what we should be doing everywhere. Um, you know, prioritizing self determination, uh, freedom, and 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 that sort of thing. And I guess the other the, to to finally make my way to a question here, um, what you said about Russian imperial ambition. Um, I mean, this may seem, I mean, as a Latvian married to a Ukrainian, as almost as almost second nature to you. Like, of course, you know, like we're we're right next door. We've had to deal with this all the time for a lot of people in the United States and in Western Europe. I mean, this almost came as a out of the blue surprise. Like, I mean, you know, even even still, we have some nutcases that want to argue it was somehow NATO expansion that provoked a, a, a response or anything like that. But but I mean, the reality is. And, it, and it's a hard reality to recognize, and I and I wonder, you know, what you would what you would say to this. I mean, why why has the West kind of failed so dramatically for so long in its policy toward Russia? I mean, what is it in your view that makes us so 
blind to um, to to what is so clearly apparent to Latvians and Ukrainians and Poles and Czechs and and, and, and Finns and so on and so forth. Yeah, and, and, and you basically hit the nail on the head uh, about my question. This is exactly what, what what's also motivated me to do the YouTube channel, because having talked with a lot of people here in Denmark and their perception of Russia was so completely different from my perception of Russia. And that's why it kind of drew the desire to explain. But I want to stop on one point just to kind of clarify, because I try to clarify it every time it's mentioned. And when we're talking about NATO expansion, what we mean is, is independent and free countries willingly decide to join the defensive alliance. That's NATO expansion. So it's a very important thing. And I think sometimes people just, when they talk about NATO expansion, they project it as a projection of American imperialism. And uh, uh, in, in a sense, yes, but also willing participation really matters in this sense. Like when we're talking about uh, Warsaw Pact countries, like this is kind of also building to the answer of your question, that the Warsaw Pact countries, a lot of them weren't really allies of the Soviet Union. They were forced into being an allies of the Soviet Union. So saying that, well, we in US never really saw Baltics as part of uh, Soviet Union. Well, we in Baltics also never saw Baltics as part of the Soviet Union. But the point is that uh, they were, it was a forced will of a very specific entity on these groups. From the outside perspective, when you are inside of information vacuum, uh, rationalization starts like it's just how we work as a society we start having these uh, I know it's it's it, it taken on another uh, name but generally speaking memes it's like ideas that are just penetrating our thoughts about how things work in the society and debunking those memes uh, might be quite tough especially when people are in a certain paradigm uh, like for example a simple perspective that not everyone in the Baltic speaks Russian is mind blowing for a lot of the people that were just like, well, well, what, what do you mean you don't speak Russian? But like, huh? huh? So it's totally. it's the lack of information, and then filling that information vacuum with certain stereotypes, memes, ideas, plus extensive, extensive Russian propaganda. We paid a lot of our hard-earned cash here in the West to the Russian government that they took our money, said, thank you, and now we're going to erode your democracy with it. Yep. And, and because countries lived in this after the, the Soviet the Union fell and so on, there was a huge vacuum of information. And that vacuum information that needs to be filled with somehow, it was filled with a lot of post cold war uh, real like like memories together with an extensive russian propaganda because none of the other countries had enough money or monetary power or cultural power to project their picture outwards maybe the closest neighbors understood that but as soon as you get one two countries away from it then you start getting de strong deviations from what's the actual reality on the ground. So the, the expectation, basically, that's the answer of the question. It's just a lot of our own money working against us. Well, and it's right. And, and it's also, I mean, it's, it's, it's Russian disinformation. It is, it is also the money we paid into Russia, but then it's also the money that Russia sends West, right? I mean, and I, I would be remiss, you're in Denmark, if I didn't mention the very famous Donsky Bank scandal of, you know, 200 billion in Russian money laundered through Donsky Bank, you know? And then, of course, I mean, Donsky is, is just the, 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 the tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, there's Svedbank was doing the same thing. Raiffeisenbank was doing the same thing. Deutsch, Deutsche Bank. Like, I mean, it just, it just goes on and on and on. All these ways that, that Russian money came west darkly. So we would send, we would send money to Russia to pay for oil and gas and blah, blah, blah. And then some of that money would come back into our politicians' pockets, laundered, you know, um, and, and, and not just politicians, but also like influencers and elites and art and all that kind of thing to, to, to push that Russian perspective of the world, as you say, because that's the, that's the idea. And the Russian perspective of the world says Central and Eastern Europe is some kind of weird backwater 
and they'll never be part of your group and blah, blah, blah. Now, have you noticed at all? And I mean, again, I think you're in a very interesting position to comment on this being a, a, a Latvian in Denmark, which Denmark's like, I mean, Denmark's like, if you could, you can't get more Western European than Denmark, right? Like Denmark, that, like what economists talk about getting to Denmark, you know, like Denmark is the, 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 for economists, I, I take great exception to this personally, but, but for economists, the precipice of accountability and good governance and economic development. And here you are, um, uh, 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 an Eastern European married to an Eastern European, uh, you know, in this place. Have you noticed a change since the full scale invasion? Is there, is there more curiosity and respect for your perspective? And, and is there a little bit more of a skepticism of Russian talking points now? Absolutely, that's that's undeniable. Like uh, I don't want to say that it's only to me, but a lot of local analysts, like Anna Spock Nielsen, obviously military analysis, and then uh, also many many of the local media. Like one of the major things that I noticed, for example, when I compared Danish TV sh television uh, representation of the war in Ukraine with, for example, German representation, I saw some of the news. Maybe not everyone, but some of the news. They would say so the war in Ukraine or the conflict in Ukraine. They would say in Germany, whereas in a Danish TV, they would say Russian invasion into Ukraine, very, very clearly distinguishing those facts. And, and Denmark has had a very, very strong position. Danish society in a large sense is built on trust. And that trust means that you abide by the essentially the your obligations. And uh, Russia was very good with muddying enough the water that Crimea somewhat went you know, undecided. Even now we're hearing echoes from that undecisiveness that we had in Europe that some of the politicians say, oh, we should leave Crimea out of the discussion of this war, which is like, are you forgetting Same. what you said like Absolutely. six years ago? Completely. And then uh, right now we're hearing Denmark saying, it's like, no, this is not acceptable. This is completely beyond any kind of redeeming possibilities. You cannot put trust, have a document that recognizes the borders of your neighboring country, then invade that country, and then you also take the lives of the people and then consider it normal or at least discuss about normality. It's a huge betrayal of trust, not even counting the whole um, requirement for the prosecution of the murder. So I think it was a lot of the very, very emotional aspects that this is a huge, um, huge undermining of a trust that was there uh, because there was an uh, idea in the Denmark, the Danish society that was brotherly nations. Well, brothers don't do this to yeah. each other. You mean, you mean the brotherly nations of, of Ukraine and Russia? Very, very roughly. I, th I say it as it was perceived here rather than it was yeah, being yeah, actually definitely. true. Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was another Russian narrative that, that they Correct. spent a lot of money and a lot of effort pushing. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's, what drives me the craziest the most is, is obviously these kind of talking points where we say we never will recognize Crimea as part of Russia. And then as the next term, we say, well, maybe we should consider because like this, you know, and then we talk about, well, like Ukraine has so big problems with the corruptions and stuff like this. And then you come to the point, well, how did Russia became so rich? How did the politicians that Russia supports get their money? Why so much dirty money? And I can guarantee you, I don't have the full account for everything, but if there would be a full investigation of all the flows of the dirty money, we would beat Ukrainian corruption 17 times over easily. Yeah. So whenever like people in Europe here sits down on their high horse and say, okay, we are so nice and tidy. We have beaten all of the corruption. There is no problem that we're having, but that nasty Ukraine, mm, we cannot let them uh, be at our table because they are the, you know, the broken ones. And that completely messes with my head because I just see this every day. You know, every country, you ask every common citizen in the country is like, is your government, so has your government solved corruption? And I'm pretty sure you know what the answer is going to be. Totally. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, in the United States, you know, I mean, there's there's extreme frustration among Americans with government corruption. So, I mean, it's like, no, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 this, this kind of ins, incessant, 
notion that Ukraine is some sort of irredeemably corrupt basket case is absolutely another one of these Russian disinformation narratives. That's not to say there aren't real issues that need reform in Ukraine. There are real issues that need reform everywhere. But 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 to keep to keep like dismissing Ukraine as oh Ukraine is corrupt, Ukraine is corrupt, Ukraine, that is that's that's disinformation. That's us buying another Russian narrative. So I mean I, I just see us we're trying very, very hard to shrug off, you know, thirty years of extremely successful Russian information operations. And this is this is one thing I've really kind of come to recognize is that asymmetrically Russia is very powerful. Like, like through its financial, it's, it's really its targeted financial influence and its targeted disinformation and its sort of covert uh, campaigns and stuff like that. It's, it's quite influential. But in a sense, it's thrown it all away now right? because, because, I mean, part of its disinformation was also we are a military juggernaut that you can never face. Turns out not really true. So I think this is kind of a good segue into talking about, you know, the, 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 the war on the ground, the, you know, which where we have the second largest military in the world getting whipped by a, you know, ragtag group of Ukrainian freedom fighters, you know. Um, and and um, I guess the big news, uh, and we, we, we touched on this briefly before we started recording, but I, but I think it's really important because it's all over the place, is that Russia's going to engage in this counter, this whatever. Every, everything's a counteroffensive. Really, I mean, for Russia, it's a new offensive. Um, with 500,000 new troops, which of course is like double what they started the war with somehow. Um, I mean, how do you, how do you read this? What is this? Does this, does this pose, um, of like a very, very serious threat? I mean, I mean, what, how are we to understand this? Yeah. Um, well, first I want to be clear about the number because that's, that's kind of important to be clear about the fact. Oh, yeah. So the number of 500,000 was presented by Alexei Reznikov when he was talking with French jur journalism. So the job of Alexei Reznikov is to motivate outside parties to help Ukraine. So that's his basically what he needs to do. That's why, for example, inflating numbers is a really good tactic because it's overall harmless in a big sense, unless you're like lying in proportions, which I don't feel he is. What I think happened is a misunderstanding that a lot of people think that it's uh, 500,000 new troops that are just at the borders, which I don't really see it be true. So my latest kind of information, and also this was uh, suggested, I believe, by some of the American intelligence, there is about 300, 320, 330-ish thousand troops on the ground right now along the, the combat line with Ukraine. Uh, besides that, Ukraine, uh, Russians are also had about a reserve of 100,000 from the mobilized forces they had before that were still in the training and now Russia is starting to pouring them in. So it was 400, like, so it's in total it's like 420, 430. Uh, the numbers might be a bit low, so maybe he added like a couple of tens of thousands here and there. And, and this might be the number that that he came to like, okay, it might be ending up towards the 500,000 number. So I think it's that the total number of troops all together, there, including, all together. The, including the starting 200,000 plus Mobix plus yeah. extra Mobix, I guess. Cor correct. And, 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 and th so that's why, because None, none of the analysts or intelligence communities that I ever follow has said that Russia has mobilized 500,000 troops. Yeah. More importantly, it was revised downwards, actually. That makes a lot more sense. I mean, I mean, it, it, it just struck me as kind of wacky tobacky that you could summon 500,000 additional troops, almost doubling, more than doubling your presence in the field. That doesn't, that just doesn't yeah. seem right to me. And also, you'd feel like you'd see more of the... Like, remember when that before the invasion began, we just seen pictures everywhere. Here are all the encampments, everything like that. We're not seeing any of that right now, you know? So, I mean, it just kind of, it didn't sit right with me. It didn't pass the straight face test. So yeah, that makes yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Well, I, I, like, if, if you follow some of the intelligence, they, they have the pictures of, like, big still encampments. Uh, but Russia tries not to keep a lot of uh, their troops in tightly packed areas uh, because high marks are very, very deadly. Right. 
<laughs> and, oh, maybe that's like, the reason you don't see it so yeah, much anymore. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> some of that. And also the speculation about the potential of long-range artillery, which might be prolonged because as far as I understood, it's going to be um, requested by the Ukrainian support package. I forgot the original name. It's basically when the U.S. government is going to repro- request the producer of these uh, of these weapons to manufacture them. Uh, so that might take a longer time to deliver it to the ground. These are the... These are the 150 kilometer, the Correct. small diameter bombs. Yeah, the 90 mile ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly one. So those are that are speculated that might be in next package. Uh, there's also details that they might be just requested from Boeing for them to then uh, produce them. Uh, but b- besides that, the answer to your original question <laughs> before I deviated to the numbers uh, about the potential attack. Yes, it might be happening. However, um, it might not be the same thing and most probably is not going to be the same thing that we saw at the start of the war. Uh, Russia does not have the capacity. Well, first of all, they revised their plan. They thought that driving columns through the through the roads where they can be uh, uh, assaulted by partisans with, uh, and with Ivan, with his trusty RPG is probably not the best idea. So instead, they will... Uh, try to do the slower tactic. They do not have the artillery supply because of the work of the HIMARS. Their logistics systems is extremely complicated now. So they try to do in small batches somewhere, stack it uh, under the school building where you also have the Mobix. All these fancy tactics, they require time, dedication, and it's not something that you can just easily adapt going forward. So they cannot have like a large scale offensive from all sides that's just gonna penetrate kilometers after kilometers and kilometers. So instead they will focus most likely, this is what the analysts that I'm following are saying, that they are gonna do these more of a dedicated uh, specific attacks to the target points, try to improve their logistics, push forward very, very slowly and try to grind down essentially Ukrainians, which is a very interesting proposition, but we don't really see that they are having such a good time. And if Ukraine gets no. more capabilities, then it's just going to be a one-way ticket for many, many Ivans. Well, and, and, and they're definitely getting more capabilities. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, just this morning, the announcement that, you know, uh, I, I mean, gosh, the whole the whole German tank saga, just unbelievable. But now we've got, you know, Schultz approving the export of these these older Leopard ones. So, I mean, I mean, just the like, like not only is Ukraine going to have this this sort of group of very modern top of the line, you know, tanks, but like older Western tanks are also going to be sent. I mean, we're looking at like potentially, I mean, just hundreds of. Of tanks, so I mean, like, the, I think the capability is going to keep going up and up and up. I mean, it's and in, and even though I mean, I even though President Biden has given this kind of whatever off the cuff no to F-16s, I think F-16s are ultimately going to go. I mean, that's been the the way with all of this stuff, right? Is it like uh, no sanctions? Okay, sanctions. No javelins. Okay, javelins. No Heimers. Okay, Heimers. No Patriots. Okay, Patriots. You know, and, and just no Bradleys, tanks, whatever. You know, and it just keeps going and going. So I think. I think we're heading that direction. I think the question for me, and, and very interested in your view on this, but I mean, what does it take for Ukraine to kind of to win? Like, obviously, to, uh, uh, the victory condition is every Russian soldier leaving. But I guess what 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 prompts every Russian soldier leaving? For example, like I I've kind of seen it as taking Crimea, for instance, could could be the thing that does it. But I'm but I'm interested in your in your take on this. No, I agree. I agree. The, the only thing I would add that with all the supplies, especially German supplies, the correct question we need to follow up when they say we're going to deliver something is when, because that yeah. has been also the, the very important, because one thing is Ukraine is going to get 80 plus tanks this spring so they can uh, stop or counterattack in the Russian offensive. Another thing that they're going to get 80 plus tanks after their repairs, remodeling in two years. That's a little bit different kind of perspective. But as to answer when the war ends, well, there are two sides to it. First, obviously, the military victory. The military victory, I think Crimea, and I agree with that, has been a crowning jewel in Putin's propaganda into this whole narrative of him as this strong leader that can put NATO to its knees, that can, and I'm going to actually refer to your latest, I think it was, or one before discussion, where you were talking about that there was a huge possibility for Putin to essentially, if he would win Ukraine, 
then a lot of NATO and the Western countries would basically be shocked and might even dissolve themselves as a NATO and alliance. And he actually had the possibility and threat to NATO to put it to the knees. I don't believe that it's, he's capable anymore, but I still feel that there is a lot of these phantom fears that within a lot of politicians and a lot of those fears, especially for the West, are linked to Crimea. We talked many, many things that for Russians, Crimea is very important. It's been the crowning jewel in Putin's history, what he achieved as a leader because he decided to be a military leader. So no one will remember the stable times that he brought. This was a big Russian narrative. We need stability. That was basically his presidential campaign. As soon as he started this big war, he became a war leader. And as a war leader, he is judged on his conquest. So for Russians, Crimea is going to be a big, devastating victory, uh, uh, defeat. We are already right now seeing that they're starting slowly to eat each, at each other's throat, and it's just going to get so much accelerated with the fall of Crimea. Secondly, it's very important for the West to completely kill the any kind of echoing narratives of Russia as this strong, unbeatable nation. As soon as this major Putin's uh, jewel in his crown is just taken, is like, no, it's not yours, you should abide by the laws. At that moment, I am clearly believing that it's going to be the last drop for any kind of discussions about the possibilities of coming back to a negotiating table with Russia. It's not going to work. Ukraine is never going to agree to negotiation because why? Uh, but uh, for a lot of the talking points inside of our societies, I believe this will be just very, very healthy. Yes. I mean, I... Couldn't have said it better myself. Totally agree with you, Georgie. Well, hey, wonderful to have you on the show. That was a great chat. Look forward to being in touch in the future and watching more Hope of your so. content. Maybe we can do a live stream together one day. That'd be fun. It would be amazing. You know? All right. Till next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Subscribe and like Paul's channel and my channel at The Ukraine Matters. That's right. Right back at you, Georgie. <laughs> Subscribe and like Georgie's channel. Okay. Bye-bye. See you.